But at the same time, if they tell you, well, I don't accept it, it's been corrupted, you don't have to accept that argument. You don't have to take that as a valuable argument. You can say you have the burden of proof to show me it's been corrupted, and then, which they can't do. Why? Because all they do most of the time, these Muslims here, is just regurgitate something they've heard. Because when they say to you it's corrupted, say prove it and watch their face drop. Well, there's a question you got. It's just curious, yeah, about something. Go ahead. I just want to ask. Can you blow your face? Can you can you blow can you blow your face? It's up to you guys, don't feel forced. He can blur you if you like, no one will see you. He can give you a lady's voice, he can do all kinds of things. There might only be a few questions. That's fine, it doesn't matter, it's five minutes. We might not put it out, but whatever. Yeah, don't, you don't have to. I wish I had my note puzzled with the questions. I just wanted to say, so that when we watch people like you, it can get too overwhelming and like, I don't know where to start. Right. Especially for people that like, more like, I'm lazy, I can be lazy and like, learning stuff is hard. Is hard, I don't sound stupid. Where do we start? Like, is that a good I know the Bible, obviously. Yeah. I, I, okay, so I, I would start. A good place to start, all due respect, is to do what you said you're not doing, and that's to begin looking into things. Because you're never going to be able to respond to things if you don't look into the, to the arguments. I mean, with, with me, for example, um, if I engage in an argument, say, say if I know I'm coming here to debate a certain topic, I'll spend a week or so looking into that topic. Um, even if I'm familiar with it, I'll just, I'll just recap my mind and my memory over that topic. And ju just, I mean, I suppose things work differently for everyone. For me personally, I like to read. I mean, not everyone's the same. You might, you might like to listen. The, the, you can... Yeah, well, you, you can listen. Okay, you're sure. But you can listen to things. I mean, you don't have to buy a book. You can buy the book in audio form. You like buying books. You just don't like reading them. <laughs> okay, well if, well, if that's the case, you can buy audio. Like, you, do you drive? Do you guys drive? Okay. Okay. So, do you like do you, do you travel on the train to work or bus or walk? I listen to that. Well, this this I, I do the same. That's what I mean. Yeah, sure. So that's 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 a good place to start. You know, get like a lecture or something. Listen to that lecture, and then I would say don't just listen to it because we've we've all done that. I'm sure where you listen to something and then you forget what's being said. So I would say, uh, do you have like an iPhone or something? Just go on your notes or write something down, whichever is easiest. And when you hear something in that lecture that has answered something you really want write it down and then go over that lecture again with your notes and just read through them and eventually i promise you it will stick in your mind it's different with everyone but if you're not readers and you're listeners do an audio lecture do an audio book and just make notes are there essential things that every christian needs to know now sort of thing on, yeah. on different topics like because i feel like we, we're limited okay so I, I would say when you said different topics i would say try to it, it, it's not good, really, in my opinion, to stretch yourself out early on and try to deal with everything. Yes, yeah. I would say, I would say, try to narrow it down. We look at people like you. Okay. I, I would say personally, um, I would say if you're interested in what topic are you interested in the most, or is it a case of everything? Okay. So I would say, I would say. Yeah, okay, I would say that's a good place to start. The, the deity of Christ, because if you come here or you're on the street corner of Jehovah's Witnesses or anything like that, it's always going to be the Trinity, the deity of Christ, things like that. So I would say a good place to start is is because we all believe Jesus is God. So you must be able to defend that. As as uh, P Peter says in, in his epistle, he says, always be read, ready to give us um, an answer to those who ask you, basically, for the, for the hope that you have. So I would say do that. I would say look into the deity of Christ, go through the biblical passages, not just in the easy gospel, John, but look in Mark, look in the Old Testament, the typologies, all of this stuff. And I would say get that one topic done so you, you're familiar with that topic. I'm not saying you have to become an expert in it before you move on to something else, but at least become familiar within that one topic and then choose another topic. Because otherwise, if you're just going to go, I'm going to study everything in one week, you're going to struggle. Pick a topic, deal with that topic, become familiar with that topic, and then move on to another topic. Maybe the deity of Christ, when you're familiar with that, do, uh, you know, for example, uh, textual manuscripts, textual variants, things like that. Then go on to something like, I don't know, prayer, anything like that, yeah. Because I remember last week you came, what was I going to say, someone who was using things like, um, historians have proved that this... The who? Um, he was a Muslim, and he was saying like... Um, Muslim, like um, he was just giving him you know, passages like John 14. He was saying stuff like it's been corrupted and like this isn't really what they said, it's just a translation of error. When we were trying to say like, it was black and white, like, you know, when Jesus said like, before Abraham I was, they'll be like, oh, um, 
this is just a translation. It doesn't actually say that. Like, how do we, how do we say the Bible's corrupt? Okay, the, okay, they always do that. But but notice, whenever they say the Bible's corrupt, in the next breath, if it's a Muslim, they'll often use the Bible to make a point. So so it never... It, 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 yeah, but you, you need to point them out. You need to point that out to them and say you're using a double standard. But at the same time, if they tell you, well, I don't accept it, it's been corrupted, you don't have to accept that argument. You don't have to take that as a valuable argument. You can say you have the burden of proof to show me it's been corrupted, and then which they can't do. Why? Because all they do most of the time, these Muslims here, is just regurgitate something they've heard. Because when they say to you it's corrupted, say prove it, and watch their face drop. They'll change, or they might say something like one John five seven, or yeah, 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 one John five seven. They're free to bear witness in heaven. Yeah, or they'll use the long ending of Mark. And the problem is, this is why I say. Maybe do the deity of Christ, but when you get onto this topic of textual variance, because it will be brought up, even in regards to the deity of Christ, um, a good place I would say is to read is not just what scholars say, but I would say read what the church fathers say. Because you're really good at that. Okay. Well, for example, uh, uh, okay, I had this the other day. I was having a discussion with someone, and they referenced um, basically the longer ending of Mark as like it shouldn't be there. It's a corruption. It's a later edition. It shouldn't be there because it's not found in the earliest manuscripts. Okay, you can just say to them, okay, I grant it may not be found in the earliest manuscripts, but we as Christians don't just go with the earliest manuscripts. We see what those people who came before us also said. For example, um, like Irenaeus. You've heard of St. Irenaeus? Well, St. Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus says in, in his work, this is why it's good to become familiar with what our, fa our church fathers say. Do you have a book for I can recommend you some, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Because if we can reference the, the, the church fathers and then say what they said, then they yeah. can't really refute that. Well, this is the thing, especially in, text, in terms of uh, textual variants, because they'll say the earliest manuscripts don't have this reading. Well, if you look at the longer ending of Mark, for example, in Irenaeus' works, against heresy, because I believe there's five books of Irenaeus' works against heresies, but it's in book three, chapter 10, verse six, he quotes from the longer ending of Mark in verse 19. So what does that prove? It proves that the copy of Mark that Irenaeus had has this reading of the longer ending of Mark, and he predates the earliest manuscripts. So when they say the earliest manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts, it's irrelevant, because if we can show you someone in church history who had the longer ending of Mark, just because it's not found in a ma manuscript that comes later on is irrelevant to the argument. But the Muslims often don't look into this kind of argumentation. That's why I say it's important to be familiar with the fathers, because if you're familiar with the fathers as well, you're going to screw them up. They're going to they're struggle. So we, uh, a good topic's early church fathers. I, I would say, with personally, start with like the deity of Christ in, in, in the biblical text itself. And then maybe with that, uh, supplement that with some, you know, what did the early church say about these passages that you believe prove the deity of Christ? Learn how to fully defend the deity of Christ. I would say, for starters, yeah. And to preach it as well. From each gospel as well. It's, not, it's, it's no good just learning it just from God, uh, John. So no, and this is what they say. This is, this is one argument they say. They'll say it unless it's from Jesus' words himself. Right? Yeah, yeah. But the problem is, then they'll quote something um, in that same gospel that is not necessarily Jesus speaking in that particular text to, to prove something else. So they're inconsistent. But I would say, yeah, in regards to uh, the Gospel of John, um, which is what you just said, don't just use the Gospel of John, because they'll argue, well, you guys just stick with John because it's got a higher Christology. And that, that could be the case. It could, I think it probably does likely have... I feel, I feel like it's the finale. I think it would yeah, be like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's got a higher Christology. But even if you look, even if, yeah, it's clearer. But even if you look in, for example, Mark's Gospel, which most people believe to, is, is the earliest Gospel, um, in the very first three verses of Mark's Gospel, it's all about the deity of Christ. He says in verse one, this is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a, that's a claim to deity. Not only that, but what, what I say about typology as well is that Mark uses is, uh, prophecies. Okay, so okay, so type. Sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. So ty typology, for example, if you read the book of, have you read the book of Hebrews? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So if you go to Hebrews like seven, eight, nine, and ten, you'll see that it talks heavily on typology. So one one case would be um, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament was a was a was a foreshadowing or a type, we say, of the sacrifice that was to come. That was that was Christ. Yeah. So Christ fulfilled something that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament, basically. But that would be a, that would be a, an instance of typology. But Mark uses prophecy, which is why I say stick with the biblical text first and then go out to the fathers after, because in Mark's gospel. Um, he explicitly uses a, a text from Isaiah to prove the deity of Christ. So this argument that, um, well, you know, Mark's gospel doesn't portray Jesus as God, it just simply portrays him as a prophet, is bogus. Because in the first three verses, Mark draws from a prophecy in Isaiah 40 verse 3, and it says that, um, you can watch this back by the way, I know I'm going fast, but 
Uh, in Isaiah 40 verse 3, uh, Mark draws from the passage where it says that there will be a messenger in the wilderness preparing the way for God, is what it says. That's what it says in Isaiah 40 verse 3. There's someone in the wilderness who will prepare the way for God. And then look, read what Mark does. He then goes on to say, John the Baptist is this messenger in the wilderness. And he quotes exactly from Isaiah and he portrays Jesus as the one having his way prepared for him. Therefore, from the earliest gospel, we have an incredibly high Christology based upon prophecy from Isaiah. That's why it's important not just to go to the New Testament, but to look at the Old Testament prophecies and make all of those connections properly. That's in Mark chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. I never understand is it's so it's so clear for us to see who Christ is, right? And to understand it. Why do so many Muslims they just don't not, yeah. not get it? Like we know it's that. We was like giving them clear references and they just like kept on like no lies. So no. if you look at it from an open perspective, yeah. it's just clear. You must get bored of it. I think it's I think we have to be honest. It is a case of they're brought up they're brought up from a young age and they've had this pounded into their head for years and years and years. Jesus is not God. If you believe Jesus is God, you're committing shirk, which is the unforgivable sin. So for them, they can't touch that belief with a 12 foot barge pole. So anything you do say, unless they're going to be unbiased and honest, they will have to reject it. And that's just the unfortunate case. Most people say, it, it is brainwashing, yeah. They're, 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 because if you look from a Christian perspective, we can be open-minded because we're not scared to look elsewhere. Because we're, exactly, we are people of truth. Whereas some people, like all due respect to Muslims here, they'll often come and say, well, the Bible doesn't teach that. And I'll just say, have you read the Bible? No. Well, then how do you even know that? The beauty is we have the Old Testament to prove our religion. They don't have the old and new, like, disproved there. And this is another thing I was saying about typology, because typology proves uh, the Christian faith also. Because if you look at, in terms of the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay, because Islam claims to come from the line of all the Old Testament prophets. Exactly, it claims to come from those prophets, okay. So if that's the case, then we should see a perfect continuity between the Old Testament faith and the, and the faith of Islam. But we don't see that. But in Christianity, we see that Christianity is what we call the culmination of, of Judaism. It's the fulfillment of Judaism. And typology is one, way, is one good way to show that. Because, for example, like I said, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, uh, in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 10 or 9, it talks about this as something that's been fulfilled in Christ. So here's a typology where we see perfect continuation in the New Testament with the Old Testament. In Islam, we don't have that. Absolutely. There's so much continuation with the Old Testament to the New Testament, you can't deny it. But they say, no, 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 we are in perfect continuity with the Old Testament. And as you said about Ishmael, they'll say, oh, well, Muhammad comes from the line of Ishmael. Let's just say that's the case. They could, Muhammad could very well be from the line of Ishmael. That is a debatable topic. People debate that. But then you just take them back to the passage about Ishmael in the Bible. In Genesis 17, it says that um, there will be no covenant with Ishmael. The eternal covenant, the permanent covenant, is with Isaac. So if, so if, it's, if there is a covenant with uh, Isaac and not with Ishmael, when Muhammad is coming from the line of Ishmael, Muhammad has no covenant. And God in the Old Testament and New Testament is a God of covenants. And according to Genesis 17, there is no covenant with the people of Ishmael. You know the kind of life he lived for him and the person he was. What would you say about that? I would use that to describe what you were because there were some prophets that were a bit. Weird. I, I would say, the life uh, well, of Jesus was a lot yeah. better. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, there's no, there's no argument there whatsoever. Like I, I would say that when they say, I would say when they say. Muhammad is perfect, okay? That's why they attack our Old Testament prophets like David with the story of Bathsheba, you know. Yeah, exactly, but then you read Psalm 51, David's Psalm of Repentance, etc., etc. They were sinners. Yeah, exactly, they were human beings and, and the prophets sinned. David admits this in Psalm 51. That's why he says, um, you know, uh, Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Okay, David is quite clear he's a sinner, but he's a repentant sinner. Where they attack our prophets because in their minds, Prophets, for some reason, are sinless. Like Muhammad has to be a perfect man, which is problematic. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. This, this is why there seems there seems to be a disconnect between what the Islamic text says about Muhammad and what Muslims today say about Muhammad. There is this disconnect. So I think they're kind of mythologizing Muhammad a bit, in my opinion. But if you, yeah, ex but if you look at, for example. Um, the life of Muhammad, the life of Jesus. There's no comparison. And if they believe Jesus is just a prophet and Jesus lived a good life, a better life than their so-called seal of the prophets, then what does that say? Because they say he's the best of mankind, they're not saying like that. Muhammad, yeah, yeah. But if we just compare the, the, compare the two characters, Jesus and Muhammad, there's only one person there who's going to come out best of mankind. It's certainly not Muhammad. Thank God for following that. Amen. <laughs> I was going to say uh, one of Brandon Prescott was uh, your thoughts on Calvinism and Arminianism. I can't make my mind up. I'm like, well, my brother's a Calvinist. And he, you know, he reads like Romans 9 and he's saying, and, and, and it's fair play to him. The, 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 
it seems as if Carl would have them as true and I've read that quote. Through. See, okay, it's so... It's a hard one. What quotes would you use from the Bible so, to prove it? So, in, in terms of Calvinism, yeah. okay, um, this is a hard question. I, I, I would say, by the way, I'm not saying the Calvinists aren't Christians. I would never say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I accept that there are Calvinists that are Christians, absolutely. Um, but what I, what I will say is I don't think Calvinism, in my opinion, is very biblical, to be honest, because there are passages, for example, where you see, for example, Romans 9, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, Ephesians 1, verse 1 to 11, um, Romans 8. There are multiple passages that talk about predestination. It's in the Psalms, it's in the Proverbs, it's there. But it, it then, you know, so that, that's one issue. Everyone has to believe in predestination to some extent. It's just how you interpret that. And predestination is a hard subject. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, okay so I, I would say, um, but in my opinion, I would say an issue for me in terms of Calvinism would be like limited atonement. So um, limited, limited atonement in the sense of Christ only died for a certain amount of people. I would, I would disagree with that because I think when Jesus says, when Jesus says to the Jews, all day long I have, uh, I have wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. So would it make sense to say that God predestined, predestined a situation where he wanted something to happen, but he predestined it not to go according to his will? Plus you just said you lot weren't willing, which means you had a choice in the willingness. They, it, it means they have that choice, so it's not yeah. this unconditional election as such, the in, the, in the Calvinistic perspective. The Adam and Eve story won't make sense, because like, they were made to, to choose the apple, like, if Calvinism was true. Like, I, just think, I just think Calvinism is very problematic when you, when you just look at the Bible, to me personally, yeah, to me. Uh, in terms of like, you know, uh, ter perseverance of the saints is another one I think is unbiblical. There are many things in Calvinism I believe that are unbiblical, but I don't say they're not Christian, I don't say that, yeah. I accept them as Christians, of course. As long as they believe the basic gospel. They, they, they believe in the fundamentals of the faith, yeah. Are you debating anyone today? Uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, I'll see what happens, yeah. yeah. How do you do it here? You just come here randomly? And... Most of the time, I just turn up and see what happens. I yeah. watched a video on why you started. You just kept coming. Yeah, basically, yeah. That's probably what happened to us. In, in regards to how you guys learn as well, I would say if you come to a place like this, you don't have to, don't feel obliged to jump in the deep end and debate someone. There's nothing wrong with standing there and listening. And like I say, there's nothing wrong with taking notes. If you need to take notes, take notes. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea. And then you can go back, read for your notes and think, okay, would I have said it the way Ben said it or would I change it something? It's, it's nothing wrong with doing that. I, like, I, I wouldn't fully agree on everyone here, but I'm taking the best bits from them. Yeah, sure. I might not like a certain way like someone does something, but I'm still taking the good stuff. Yeah, sure. Like, I can disagree with them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Right now it's just learning, I think. Yeah. Because I don't want to make a fool of our religion. No, I, I would say take baby steps. There's no need to jump in the deep end. Just take baby steps, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of pressure sometimes. Like, we need to be doing a lot. Look, right, okay, so there's nothing wrong yeah. There's nothing wrong with having a chat with someone about your faith, telling them what you believe. In fact, I would say the gospel says you're called to do that. But at the same time, I'm not going to say go and pick a fight with the best guy here. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, know, know your limits and just take it slow. That's what I would say. Huh? He's not the best, no. No, Shamsi's bad. I'm waiting for you to debate one of them. Yeah, I've got a debate of Hashim on uh, Soko Films. Have you seen that? Yeah, no, I've commented. You've seen that? Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. He was bad, he was bad. He was really bad. He's so dishonest. Yeah. Hashim, Hashim made a basic Christological error. What did he say? He said, because he admitted that like two or three weeks later, he said to me, I made a mistake. Yeah. But he didn't say that on camera. Because he said to me, um, oh, do you believe Jesus has one will? I said, yeah. No, no, sorry. Do you believe Jesus has two wills? I said, yes. He said, that's a heresy. I said, name the heresy. He couldn't name the heresy. He got it the wrong way around. The early church said that one will was a heresy because Christ has two natures. Christ is, Christ is one divine person. There's not two persons, that's Nestorianism. He's one divine person with two natures. And to be fully human, he has to have a human will. He is fully divine, so he has a divine will. Okay. So the early church said that the teaching of one will was a heresy. The teaching of two wills was orthodoxy based upon the two natures. Hashim got that entirely the wrong, wrong way around. Yeah, but what, what, what Hashim says, he comes in, he acts like he knows what he's talking about, and he doesn't. He's, he's a really bad, and this is one thing I say to him, you're a bad Christological student. Really, really bad. Really bad. Well, when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he was like praying out, like he, he plainly had his own will. Not my will, but your will yeah, be done, yeah. Obviously, what his will was to do what the Father wanted, but exactly. it's still his own will, right? Exactly, yeah. So, so the, like, based upon, th th this gets into, this is why I say take it slow, because complex, this gets into another doctrine called, um, another, another, I'm going to use some fancy word here, communicatio idiomatum, which means the communication I think so, yeah. basically it means the um, communication of the master. The communication of the properties in terms of the two natures of Christ existing with that one person. So there's a lot to it. So I would say just take your time. That's all I would say is take your time. There's no rush. 
enough? Like, do, you, like, do you reckon we should find teachers and stuff? Like? I would say get yourselves connected to a local church, yeah. I yeah. tried today, but um, I felt like he was just reading up the script. Yeah, yeah. we had like one script and it was in like teaching any theology, it was a bit strange. Oh, okay. Um, I can't comment, I wasn't there, but I, I, I would say, I would say find yourselves a good solid local church, get connected with that church because it's not only that for the teaching and the fellowship, but they'll pray for you, you can pray for them, you're part of a community, you can reach out to them, can you pray for me? You know, some you can learn from someone, they can learn from you. It, it's a good thing. We started with our church, so for Christians like us that started like literally watching debates and stuff. You know, we become Christians so randomly. We just became off YouTube. Okay. okay. We didn't have a church. Yeah, sure, yeah. Our families, my family. Were okay. Sure. So that's why stuff like this is very important. Yeah. To guide us further. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We yeah. might not know where to go, but we get stuck. Yeah, because that, if you read Ephesians 4, yeah. Ephesians 4 says that God has given us teachers, elders, pastors, etc., etc. So if God has given us those things, these teachers within the church, don't neglect that. Get yourself connected. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we came here today. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. We, we really do appreciate what you're doing it because without you and Bob and like, okay, this whole part would be overrun. Oh, I, pre I appreciate that, but oh, yeah. I'm sure God would. I'm sure God would replace us if we went. Yeah. I don't know. That would be a bit hard. I'm not even being a fanboy. It's just like it's, it's genuine. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. But, um, Thank I'm you. I'm gonna ask one more thing. <laughs> sure. Uh, Kay says you're a Catholic. Yeah, I'm a Catholic. Really? Yeah. So, what was you before? Uh, for seven years, I was a I was a Protestant. What made you change? Historical study. I, I, I took a course with uh, Spurgeon's, but in, in, yeah, I took a course there and uh, then went on to study church history and I, I changed uh, church, yeah. Because when she said that, I actually thought in my head, like the early church fathers were all Catholic, weren't they? Absolutely, like, well, pretty, like, yeah. Like, Irenaeus and all that. Yeah. Like, what do you think about the Pope? Like, you know, so, like, you don't, know, like, so with the Pope thing, do you. Like, yeah. I, believe, I believe he's the Pope. I believe in the office of the papacy, of course, yeah. It doesn't mean, it, it does, it doesn't mean that everything he does and says is always going to be right in, in the unofficial sense. When, when we say um, papal infallibility, we don't mean that everything he says, if he's on an airplane or in a pizza shop, everything he says is infallible. It's when he speaks from, the, from his total apostolic authority, uh, you know, on behalf of the, the, the chair of Peter, then it becomes ex what we call ex cathedra. So yeah. there's that's why I say don't jump into that, yeah, you know, yeah. trying to refute everything at once. So, just no, no, take no, your time. Yeah. I would I would say if you're non-denominational, I'm not saying it's like wrong or you're not a Christian. Not saying that, but if you're not, yeah, if, yeah, if you're non-denominational, I would say that it then becomes a case of you're just gonna you're just gonna. Where do you stand? There's no. I mean, for like, the, for example, the Reformed Baptists, they have like the Westminster Confession of Faith. The Catholic Church has the Catholic Catechism, the Magisterium. We have we have something we can go to. If you're non-denominational, it becomes a case of just pick what you like. I'm not saying it's necessarily like condemning you to hell. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying non-denominationals aren't Christians. I'm not saying that. I just think it's good to be rooted. Yes, you are. You need to stop now. Uh, last question I'm going to sure. ask. Um, what's your views on like, whether you can lose your salvation? I think you can, yeah. Can. I think the Bible clearly teaches that. I think it clearly, I think it clearly teaches that. Because if you um, if you look at, for example, uh, okay, yeah, well, okay. If you look at if you look at John John 15, John 15 verse 1 to 6, um, basically Jesus says to us that. There are those, he is the branch, he is the um, he is the vine, and we are the branches. So we are connected to him. So then Jesus says, "Those who are in me, if they do not bear fruit, the Father will cast out." Basically, okay. And then in verse six, it says, "Those who do not abide in me, who are cast into the fire." So it would show there you must abide in Christ. And if you don't abide in Christ, then you're going to be cast into the fire. And I would say there are multiple other places. Paul says to the Galatians, if you do X, Y, and Z in terms of circumcision, in Galatians 5, 4, he says you have fallen from grace. You can't fall from grace if you never had grace. So I would say, if you look at, we're going to get into another whole rabbit hole, but there is so many passages in the New Testament, I, I say, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 6, Luke, yeah, ex exactly. There's, there's many different passages in the New Testament. But, but then it becomes, but then that's what the Calvinists would say. Oh, if they do these certain things, they would, they were never really truly Christian. Then it becomes meaningless. Then you can't tell who's a Christian ever, and they can't even tell if they're a Christian because they don't know if they're going to go ahead and do those things in the future. It becomes, it, it's a bad argument. Yeah. What, what is a better argument is to say that people can be Christian. And then at some point in their life, if they become a Muslim, an atheist, Jehovah's Witness, they can, as Paul says, fall from that grace they once had. Which is why in Hebrews 10, verse 29, 
it says that they have spurned the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenants by which they were sanctified. Now, in the Calvinist perspective, it, in, in the order of salvation, it goes uh, justification, then sanctification. I would just simply ask your brother, can you show me anyone who is sanctified by the blood of the covenants who wasn't first justified by it? And when he can't show you that person, then just explain to him, that's because that person doesn't exist. Somebody can be justified, sanctified, and then fall. That's okay. That's, that's fine. Are you okay to shake hands or fist bump? Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. I appreciate your time. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's two two nice chaps. Um, basically, the new Christians they watch uh, the psycho films. They watch the videos we have and the debates we have here, and they're just asking how they get started. They had questions from um, Muhammad. Uh, we went through. You know, Muhammad supposedly in the Bible, Genesis 17. I'm um, trying to think. We went through. We went through. What did we go through, JC? We went through. We went through some of the Old Testament, where the start in regards to the church fathers, the deity of Christ. We spoke about. Um, they had questions about can someone lose salvation? Uh, they asked multiple different questions, and um, I'll just say I've forgotten everything we spoke about, so watch the video. <laughs> Thank you, Ed.